everybody, and welcome to uh, OSU Extension Agronomic Props Team's first ever virtual corn college and soybean school. I'm Mary Griffith, an Extension Educator in Madison County, Ohio, and I'm one of the Agronomic Crops team leaders along with Amanda Doritas and Laura Lindsay, and the three of us will be mo uh, moder moderating throughout uh, the day. So thank you for joining us. All right. Well, thanks for joining uh, for the second half of our program. Uh, we're going to turn our attention uh, now to soybean. Uh, so I'm Laura Lindsay. I'm the soybean and small grain extension specialist here at Ohio State. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we have several soybean specialists, including uh, Dr. Mark Laux, who will be talking about weed management in soybean, uh, Dr. Ann Dorns, the soybean pathologist, and Dr. Kelly Tillman, who is uh, going to focus on insect management in soybean. For Mark Laux, our weed specialist for agronomic crops at Ohio State University. So, um, Mark, I will turn it over to you. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to cover a few different subjects here today, kind of uh, centered on water, hemp, and some residual herbicides uh, and things like that. Um, I am, as someone pointed out, in my doomsday cellar where I do my work to stay away from uh, a couple of labs and birds and things like that. Um, just to kind of start off, um, you know, we do our surveys at the end of every year in soybeans, looking at weed populations to try to, you know, keep a handle on what's going on. We had good news in 2020, riding around in the summer of 2020 into fall, I thought we had a lot of really clean fields and the data from our group and also our educators reflected this. So we cover, you know, 45 to 50 counties. We covered about 5,000 fields this time. And normally we're sitting at about 50% of our fields weed free and that popped up to 74% this year. And giant ragweed and Ameris tail populations were cut about in half compared to what we've seen in previous years. Um, and common ragweed was down in ours as well, which is most of the problem in Northwest Ohio. Um, and, you know, I attribute that to use of the new traits. I mean, once you start incorporating you know, Liberty Link beans, Extend, and Enlist. I mean, you've got some really nice post options to control those. The outlier is water hemp, which continues to spread and increase. And I think people are still getting a handle on what the control program is and what type of resistance they have and things like that. So our study where we didn't separate pigweed and water hemp, we had 8%, uh, but up to 31% in Western Ohio. And of course, West Central Ohio is, is really where it's had its longest history. Our extension educators do a similar uh, survey for us. They cover 100, 125 fields, something like that. We have 26 counties participating this year, and their numbers are usually harder on weed control than we are, and I think that's because um, they can pick a stretch of road that just can really be infested depending on, I think, who's farming it. So they covered about 2,600 fields, but they were their numbers, I think last year they were 29% weed free, and they were up to 41% weed free, and their numbers for giant ragweed and mare's tail were cut in half also about, um, and then we have a lot of participation with Educators in Northwest Ohio, which is where common ragweed is an issue, so it's a little higher here at 5%. Um, their number for water hemp is pretty high. It's at 11% and 14 to 24%, and they do separate it out um, from red root pigweed. So, you know, while, while new technology is getting us a better handle, at least temporarily, it's reset the clock, I think, back to when Roundup Ready was first came out for giant ragweed and mare's tail. Um, in our thinking, water hemp is still an issue, and... Uh, still spreading and we're still having some fields pot, you know, sort of balloon up um, that are going out of control here and there. Um, I, I, one of the things I want to point out before I come back to water hemp is, uh, and this is just something to keep an eye on, we, um, anytime we start to oversimplify programs and take out fall herbicides and delay our burn down, which we can do with some of the new systems, and I think in some cases people are oversimplifying the systems, taking out residuals and things like that. It tends to open the door for the winter weeds and dandelion and some of those weeds to come back in. And so we're picking up an increase in those. Um, and, you know, the value of fall applications, even if they're used every other year or occasionally to manage some of these weeds is really invaluable to prevent the seed. And I mean, this is an example from one of our research plots showing uh, it's a May 2nd photo and really anything you do in the fall that works, it doesn't have to have residual and you really shouldn't be using residual herbicides there. Does a nice job of keeping things clean into spring. And one of the, this does a couple of things for you. One is it starts the, you know, starts you fresh on mare's tail in the spring. So you're dealing with new emergers rather than those that have overwintered. Um, it also in wet years and, and, you know, burn down becomes an issue in wet years when you can't get in. And that photo on the right just gets bigger and bigger. 
and you start to have to cobble together a, a more and more complex and higher rate burn down program and it still starts to struggle, it really takes care of you know some of that in terms of being an issue. One of the weeds that is resurging, and this kind of reminds me of the early 2000s really, is that uh, back when Roundup Ready first came out and we oversimplified and took out residuals and did some other things, I mean, we had some fields in the late 90s into early 2000s where you couldn't even see the ground for water hemp and we had to go back to fall applications. And I'm getting questions on dandelion again. And one of the questions is, okay, I have some, but my, you know, really fairly aggressive program of dicamba or 2,4-D, whatever that I can use both pre and post emergence is, isn't taking it out. And dandelion is a tough weed. It just likes to have its life cycle interrupted in the fall really to get good control. And you can see this is in this June 18th photo in a field we have some established plants like that one on the right that's flowering and then some new seedlings. And, you know, really young plants, um, you know, you're gonna get some activity out of your residual herbicides, the ones coming from seed. And then also, you know, a good post-emergence treatment can take those out. One of the problems though is the, in, that, in that system where you're not doing fall once in a while and some things like that, you can start to get some bigger and bigger dandelion plants, big tap roots, and they just don't respond to herbicides near as well. The burn down situation gets tougher. One of the things we did back then um, was do a series of every week uh, roundup, roundup 2,4-D applications. I don't know if anybody remembers us talking about this. It's been getting on probably 20 years now. Um, and what we found is, that, you know, once we start to get these real um, larger plants with big tap roots, weather really affects how effective the burn down herbicide is, and you're just going to have a tough time. So our recommendation is, you know, do something in the fall. It's, you can do it for six dollars worth of herbicide. Do it once in a while, every other year. Um, whatever to try to keep some of those problems at bay. And what that'll keep you from doing is um, struggling with control of some weeds probably in the spring like dandelion, but then also having to go to a more aggressive, more expensive burn down program that doesn't work as well in certain years. Um, just a couple things on new herbicides in case you see these. There's nothing uh, earth shattering here. Reviton is a sharpened lookalike. We actually have only one year of experience with this. So we, in the weed control guy, we didn't, we didn't rate it. Our assumption is it's a lot like Sharpen. It's the same family, um, same site of action. You can use it in corn, soybeans, and wheat, although it has to be at least 14 days before soybean planting. And so that limits um, its uh, effectiveness somewhat, but you can see the rate structure there is similar to Sharpen. That's all I can really say about it. I mean, I assume the way we use Sharpen is usually with some glyphosate or glufosinate uh, or something like that. So it's being sold, so you may see it. Uh, Elite 27 for the GT27 bean, that's a bean that has resistance to glyphosate, glufosinate, and um, also isoxaflutal, which is what Elite 27 is. And it's the same as Balance Pro in corn, but it doesn't have a safener that um, the balance gets added to it uh, in the corn. So, I mean, we've worked with this herbicide for a long time. We know what it does. Um, it's fairly broad spectrum. Um, one of the strengths that has some activity on grasses, probably more so than a lot of the broadleaf products we use in soybeans now, Pretty broad spectrum on broadleaf weeds. And one of the strengths here is if you've already burned out all your ALS inhibitors, you know, the classic and first rate inceptor pursuit on common and giant ragweed, um, this is a herbicide that you could put back in there on that bean and pick up some residual activity. You know, we give it, I think, a six in the weed control guide. So, you know, 60 to 70% control up front, probably better on common. And it also had some activity on, on burnt cucumber. Um, having said all this, it's an HPPD inhibitor. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's a, site of action group that mesotrione or callisto's in, this group herbicides in, Laudus, uh, Shield X, um, and impact in some of those herbicides. And so we're using a lot of those in corn. So, you know, our thought is, do we really need to use it in beans? But it does have a fit probably somewhere. And then another sort of uh, kind of odder herbicide is tough, which has been around a long time, Pyridate. Uh, it's a photosystem uh, two inhibitor, two B inhibitor, so group six. Uh, the problem with this, and a new company picked it up a couple years ago, is it's been used at high rates, which is fairly expensive in vegetable crops, where it has a, a spectrum of control that works. And their problem with the cost structure and everything is they really need to get the rate down on the low end um, to sell it uh, in corn, which is what it's uh, labeled for. And when you do that, you lose all your spectrum of control. So what it becomes is a herbicide you add to something else to help out it. So the one of the ways that they've plugged it is for... Um, uh, glyphosate resistant water hemp and giant ragweed. If you get to the point you can't add atrazine to the HPPD inhibitors, the mesotrion impact, a lot of shield X, this is a herbicide you can add in that can accomplish sort of the same thing because those herbicides need a little bit of help on uh, water hemp and, and giant ragweed both. So when you see it in the weed control guide, 
Uh, there's a section in the rating section that it doesn't list tough alone, it only lists tough with uh, HPPD inhibiting uh, herbicides. And then aside from that, just uh, I do have a point to make at the end of this in case you're wondering why I'm going to just show you multiple slides of premixes. We have a slug of residual premixes for soybeans. It's a good thing. We have a slug for corn also, but it's a good thing. We have more two to three way mixes that do help us out for water hemp and also mare's tail and giant ragweed, but it, it can be kind of confusing. And one of the things you can always do is go to the glossary of chemical names and manufacturers in the back. I, I, we try to keep it as inclusive as we can, but if companies don't let us know, you know what their products are, um, you know, we can't really list it. So um, you can always go there and find out what the components are um, what's a little bit uh, different is in the weed control guide itself, once we have more than two products that have the same components, basically the same label and ratio of components, um, once we have more than two, we start to list it by common name. It's just easier. And so if, you, you know, if you're looking for a product in the herbicide description section by trade name and you don't find it, that's when you can go back to the glossary and kind of figure out what's in it. We do the same thing in the and the table for control also. So some products um, where we just have two, we list it by those two. And then once we have more than that, we start listing it um, by the common name. And you may want, you may think, well, this is confusing. Why are you doing it this way? And it just seems like the way that we've evolved to do it um, at this point, which seems to be the, the way it works for us the best. And we redo the guide every year. Um, and then also the other thing here is you have a lot of variation in what the rates are and use rates of some of these. For example, if you look at the top here, um, you've got a number of products with sulfentrazone, and I mean, I'm not sure I picked the right use rate here in this table for every soil type that we have for the most common soil type in Ohio, but you can see, you know, you've got five ounces of sulfentrazone, 4L equivalent in that first product at top, and then you come down to 6.1, and then four ounces in the next one, and 4.4 on down. So, you know, when you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, where you're getting your most bang for your buck, or what you're really having, you can go to this table, and I'm going to tell you what your rate equivalents are. Same thing with Metribuzin, and I noticed putting this together, I had that fourth line, I have 0.43 pounds metribuzin, which is an active rate. And then down below, I have eight ounces of metribuzin, a couple lines down, and it shouldn't be that way, but I missed it. Um, and we're trying, you know, this uh, metribuzin rate, when it's especially in a three-way, um, you know, three-way, something like six ounces may work, but when that's one of your key components in a two-way and you really don't have good post options for Maristil, for example, we'd really like to see eight to 12. So just, this is just basically an advertisement for this table to let you know that when you're trying to compare all of these different products and they're being sold by a number of different generic, what I would say traditionally generic companies in addition to the major manufacturers, you know, this is a table that can help you. And if you ever need any help uh, trying to, you know, figure out from a label what the actual active is, don't hesitate to send me an email and I can help you out. Um, and of course, residual herbicides continue to be an important component. Um, our assumption is for the new traits, you know, when we look at the effectiveness, um, we assume that you're, you know, everyone's going to still use residual herbicides. We learned that lesson and that people are assuming, okay, that 10 to $20 or whatever for residual herbicides is a good deal in terms of controlling certain weeds. It certainly helps out on mare's tail and giant ragweed, although we have better post options. Water hemp just continues to be, you know, a, a weed that's um, even more complicated than those two, I think, and you just don't need anything working against you. And, and we, I'm not sure how you would control this weed to begin without residual without residual herbicides. Um, and we have ratings in the guide, but here's a little bit of explanation about um, those ratings. So we don't give anything better than an eight or an eight plus. And this is partly due to the fact that water hemp can emerge you know, well into the season. So there's almost nothing that'll control it uh, completely, probably low populations in certain years. So if you look at what we give an eight or eight plus, if you don't have any types of resistance except ALS and we assume it's all ALS resistant, you can see you have your PPO inhibitors at the top, the flumioxacin, sulfentrazone, that's Fowler and Authority, Metribuzin, if your rate's high enough, aroxisulfone and then isoxaflutone, then it drops down to a seven or a seven plus for some of the other acetamide herbicides, pendimethalin's in there uh, as well. And then we do get questions about linuron, which, which may be an aid on light soils. Um, we do have a lot of PPO resistance, group 14 herbicide, especially probably in the western and northwestern part of the state, although we've switched away from post-emergence flex star cobra applications to new technology. So I'm not sure we're putting more selection pressure on it, but um, you can see what happens when you get group 14 resistance is you don't completely lose effectiveness of the flumioxys in the sulfentrazone, but 
Um, their effectiveness is reduced, so you can have reduced control and then also reduced longevity of control. And so, you know, based on what our co-authors in Illinois tell us, you know, we drop them down to a seven or a seven plus, and that would depend on the uh, probably the level of the resistance. And so you can start to get more limited. Now, I should say, as I go through this, I, I'm, I'm not aware of hardly anybody who goes up with a single active ingredient for re of residual herbicides to control I mean, it's not really something that's done partly because, you you know, premixes are a better deal. Um, and so when you're putting an eight together with a seven and things like that, it does bump up your control. And then um, I'm going to talk about this as I get towards the end, but we do have, um, we're picking up, I would say, variability and control among our water hemp populations in their response to group 15 herbicides, the acetamides, that's a dual peroxisulfone. More, et cetera. Um, there's resistance to these further west. And so our expectation is we will develop resistance here as well. And, I, and I'm basically just showing you this to show if, if they drop out you know, completely, um, once you have some resistance and you start to have even more um, limited options. And of course, this is what water hemp does. It continues to evolve resistance to what we throw at it. Um, but it kind of shows you the value I think of, okay, I, I don't expect a residual to do everything, but you know, I know that I have resistance. I know I'm going to have resistance developing the post herbicide. So it's still an important component. And then you can add, of course, the viroxisulfone and metolachlor to your post applications. And, you know, this can be a judgment call depending on the level of your population, how early you are in the season for your post and how fast your soybean canopy is forming uh, and things like that. Uh, the recommendation, the consensus of the weeds people across the Midwest is um, you're better off with peroxisulfone and metolachlor. While we give acetylchlor and dimethenum in a seven when they're used pre-emergence, they tend not to be as consistent when used post-emergence, and we generally don't recommend them there. And of course, the residuals are, are one of the reasons that we can come up with a table like this. And I, I'm not sure this table really works. Um, I, I think we have a lot of value in all the new traits and good control. So, I mean, I tried to list our major weed issues here and kind of show you what... Um, you know, what, what our expectation of control would be under good conditions when it's implemented right and you use residual herbicides and right rates and right weed size and all that type of thing. And of course you can see non-GMO depending on the type of resistance you have can be expensive or difficult. I'm not sure how you would do non-GMO if you have PPO and glyphosate uh, resistance both in a population. And so that would be on the top right where you'd have poor, also Roundup Ready would drop off there. And you can see the rest of them. I mean, I basically give them excellence here once they're implemented the right way. When you look at water, hemp, and palmer, you would give the edge to extend to flex and enlist because they have the ability to spray a couple of different herbicides that still work. Um, and the other ones are good just based on how good, you know, how tough water hemp is. Um, you would, you could possibly argue that in the extend or enlist system, Dicamba and 2,4-D are probably more consistently effective on giant and common ragweed than Liberty, but Liberty is a good ragweed herbicide. It's just that it's a contact herbicide. It's more size limited. Um, probably things like that. And then the enlist on mare's tail, I have an excellent butt because it, the system itself controls mare's tail. If you go with glyphosate, you know, 2,4-D pre and come back with glyphosate 2,4-D post or some liberty, it does control mare's tail. The problem is the system itself doesn't improve your burn down. You can use a higher rate of 2,4-D, but if you haven't done something in the fall, the enlist system doesn't really improve your burn down situation compared to just a, a round of red bean very much, but the system uh, does work. Um, and again, you know, one of our issues here is um, resistance does start to limit what you can do with your post-emergent herbicides in water hemp as well. And one of the reasons that we, we focus a lot on, you know, controlling plants at the end of the season, pulling them out and preventing seed is because those, those are the ones that are likely to be resistant um, and, you know, carry over from year to year and cause populations to become uh, resistant. This is probably our most common water hemp population at this point, it's glyphosate resistant. And so if you look at the options that we have for the various systems, I have a slash over the glyphosate just to kind of give you an idea. And of course, what happens in non-GMO and Roundup Ready is you're completely reliant on post-emergence applications, products like Flexstar and Cobra and Ultra Blazer, you know, Liberty Link and Liberty Link GT27. Um, you know, you do have the option of, of some PPO in there if you wanted to mix with that. And then, you know, going on down, you can see the options that you have and the extend, extend effects and enlist T3. Um, we have a lot of populations that have this in our screen, um, mostly population from the Western and Northwestern part of the state. Um, it's, it's about a quarter to a half of our populations have resistance to both PPO and glyphosate. And so of course, one of the things you wanna do here 
Um, before you plant Roundup Ready or non-GMO beans, if you have water hemp, just try to figure out if it's PPO resistant because once you have PPO and glyphosate resistance, you can see on the top two lines there, you're out of post-emergence options. You're not gonna be able to control water hemp. The rest of it doesn't change a lot. You lose the option to use PPO and tank mixes with glufosinate. Um, and you can start to see, we do put a lot of pressure on glufosinate and, and Liberty Link and Liberty Link GT27 beans. There isn't any resistance yet. There is some resistance, low level to dicamba. Um, not that we've picked up, but in the, um, in the Midwest, there is some. Um, and then you can see you've got multiple options in extended flex and enlist T3. The difference there being, I'm, I'm not sure, I haven't really tracked whether um, it's approved to actually mix dicamba and glufosinate in the extended flex and do what you need to with um, storing the dicamba and also maximizing the glufosinate activity. I'm not sure uh, whether that works, but um, the research does show that being able to mix a couple different herbicides together that still work on water hemp can improve control, especially of larger plants and also mathematically at least um, reduced your selection for resistance. Water hemp has evolved resistance to herbicides from seven site of action families. Multiple resistance is the norm. Um, there are populations west of us um, in Illinois, especially that do have six and seven way uh, resistance. And this is most of the herbicides that are effective. I mean, the herbicide that's missing here is glufosinate still. Um, there is resistance to 2,4-D, which also carries low level resistance to, resistance to dicamba. And our expectation would be that we would continue to develop uh, more dicamba resistance. It's all group two resistant, it's all group nine resistant. Um, and then there's some multiple resistance that's developing that um, is more concerning because it, uh, we have a couple of different types of resistance. One would be where one mutation, one genetic mutation confers resistance to one type of herbicide, uh, one type of site of action. And then we have a newer site, a newer mechanism where one mutation is conferring for a mechanism that um, enhances the degradation or breakdown of herbicides in the plant or the inactivation and it crosses over sites of action. So there are populations where one mutation has conferred resistance to the atrazine, the triazines, um, and the long chain fatty acids, metallocore, and the HPPD inhibitors and 2,4-D. Um, so that's our concern. And we're starting to pick up a little bit of this. I'm just going to show you some of our screening results to give you a little bit of a handle. Um, of, of what we're finding. So, you know, from our perspective, in terms of looking at resistance developing in water hemp, we don't have to guess. I mean, you know, our, one of the things that we, again, one of the reasons we really hammer on stopping seed production is we know that this has happened west of us and this will happen here. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt in, in these. I'll show you some data and some photos here to illustrate that we're starting probably to pick some of this up um, already. Uh, we screened uh, probably four years now um, to try to get a handle, at least a rough handle on what's happening with populations. It hasn't necessarily been a lot of populations, but um, just in a nutshell on this slide, you can see from 2016 and 2018, um, it was, it was essentially all, uh, well, we assume it's all ALS resistant, that's site two. It was essentially all site nine or glyphosate resistant. That's uh, the site nine, 100% or 87%, depending on the year. And then site 14 is the PPO inhibitors. And you can see it's you know 25 to roughly 50%. And that, that range in the bottom is based on the rate. So what that means is that we had populations that resistant to 20, you know, some 25% were resistant to a, um, a higher rate and 50% were resistant to, to a lower rate, but those are multiple resistance. So anytime we find site 14 resistance, it's in conjunction with glyphosate and ALS. So that's why we, you know, we assume that we have 25 to 50% of our populations that are three-way resistant. So we, we based on this, starting from with 2019 populations, which we, which we screened, COVID slowed us down a little bit, but we screened these last um, fall. Uh, we started to switch gears a little bit, and this was to pick up some of the newer types of resistance and also see if we had this mechanism showing up that can possibly confer resistance, a single mechanism that conferred resistance across herbicide sites of action. I know there's a lot of numbers on here, but I'm gonna give you a couple of slides that organize it a little bit better. So we screened for atrazine, mesotrione, which is Callisto 24D, and still Femesophen is our site um, 14 herbicide. And we are picking up a range um, in response. It's hard to say that it's uh, resistance. We assume it's an evolved is an evolved change of response over time. 
and selection for resistance, but of course we would have to look at heritability still um, to get a handle on that. If you just focus on the first column there, um, you can see usually, uh, you know, I mean, we're looking at the use rate and use rate in the greenhouse doesn't necessarily translate from field to greenhouse completely, but you, what you can see is, is our expectation would be that once we got to a 4X rate, which is the, the six pound of the atrazine, 12 ounces of the mesotrion. If we're still, if we're getting control of most of the population, we wouldn't call that resistance at that point um, because resistance would prefer generally a higher level. But you can see, I mean, only among these populations that we screened, um, the ones that we're calling sensitive and that's more than 80% dead, you know, we didn't do that, accomplish that at the use rate for any of these uh, products. And then, you know, for, for three of them, with the exception of the Femesovin, for which we have a longer history of resistance, once we got to 4X, we did control most of them. Um, I should say that our samples here are not from single plants. And so we collect like seed from 10 plants in a field and bulk it. And so, you know, that means we could have one plant in there that's completely resistant and, and nine that aren't, which would give us some of these skew in numbers. But if you look at this a little bit different way over here, like um, we have, you know, uh, six to 21 percent of the populations here surviving a 1x rate, you know, at less than 50 percent dead, which we would indicate, which we would call resistance, um, right? And then if you look at this, um, even at that 4x rate, we've got roughly that same kind of, those same kind of numbers um, that are only 50 to 80 percent dead. And so, you know, among these 19 populations, because the percentage indicates what percent of the populations are responding that way, we're definitely seeing you know, variable response. And it looks to us like, at least in some populations, um, a, loss of a loss of response to certain key herbicides that we're using. Now we haven't used much 2,4-D, you know, so our, our, our thinking is, you know, once we start to have issues with 2,4-D, which didn't respond in the greenhouse in general, we needed a higher rate in the greenhouse compared to the field period, I think, but uh, we haven't really selected for water hemp resistance with 2,4-D because enlist, we really just started using enlist. Um, and so that would be tied in with mechanisms for resistance of the mesotron and the atrazine. Um, we also screened for metallopore, trying to pick up that group 15 herbicides. It's been fur found further west, and we found the same thing, a variable response. I would say the 1.5 pound rate of metallopore that we use probably based on the way we did our screen and the soil media mix and things like that, which probably absorbed a fair amount. You can see that um, we didn't get, um, it, it, we had a lot in the 50 to 80% control range for the 1.5 pound and it took the six pound rate to really get us up, bunch of those populations up into more than 80% control. But you can still see, um, you know, a spread here, especially at that 4X rate where you've got, um, you, you did not, you know, you got roughly a third of those populations that did not get up into the more than 80% uh, control, which, which indicate we're starting to have some variable response, I think. And this is what this looks like from a Um It's a little bit skewed because Population two on the left and the untreated at the top, you can see it didn't come up. It wasn't as robust as it was in, was in, in population seven on the right, but you can see population two at the one X and the four X rate, we have complete control of metallic core, maybe a couple tiny plants in there for the one X rate versus the population seven, you can see even at the four X rate, um, you know, we're not getting all those plants. Um, and what's interesting is if you start to kind of poke through populations and try to figure out, you know, so did we have the numbers I showed you so far don't tell you what this slide does, which is if I had a population that didn't respond to atrazine or did completely, was completely sensitive, did it, you know, did, was that one still completely sensitive to all the other herbicides as well? And, and that there was a trend for this. So here's two populations from Dark County. We don't know the history on these. These are randomly found by us in our survey. And you can see the one on the left, population two, is still sensitive to everything. So, um, you know, it's it's 95 to 100 percent control from the post-emergence herbicides here. Fully applied at 80 percent with metallochlor, which is as good as we got. You know, and going to 4X metallochlor took care of that completely. And you can see population seven has lost response to all of these herbicides, which would indicate. Um, probably multiple mechanisms for resistance in there, but also the possibility that one resistance mechanism is conferring for that enhanced uh, degradation or inactivation of herbicide that's conferring resistance to all these. Again, I can't imagine there's been that much selection for 2,4-D in that population because we just haven't used it post-emergence really. So, and I think this mimics what they're finding farther west of it. So I, I think it's a caution for us. I mean, we are starting to 
select for changes in our water hemp populations. And that again is based on the fact that we have plants going to seed at the end of the season um, that are, you know, that seeds conferring that resistance from year to year. Uh, just a few photos to kind of show you what this looks like. Um, so this is mesotrion at the 1x rate. This is population seven, that one that was as resistant to anything as any population was. Um, and the data I showed you was percent mortality, actual plant death, and we have ratings for control. And this gives you a little better handle, I think, on you know, what the survivors look like. So you can see at the 1x rate, um, where I think we had 50% survival for this. So we lost 50%, only 50% of the plants. The rest are kind of struggling. So they're, they're working to come back. And at the 4x rate, you know, we, we still had probably only 80% um, mortality or something like that. And you can see the surviving plants really aren't, aren't doing very well. So it's kind of a low, lower level resistance, I think, um, compared to what they have further west. But here's, here's atrazine in that same population. And, you know, we, we, when we went to 4X, we had fewer survivors, but they're doing fine. Um, you know, they're starting to come back gangbusters. Here's 2,4-D, which is a little harder to evaluate because you have screwy plant growth. And so it's a little bit hard to figure out what it's going to do sometimes, especially in the, it's only a 28-day um, uh, screen. So it's hard to figure it out. But you have plants, you know, that's pretty good survival um, at 1X on the left uh, for this population and plants that are kind of screwed up, but look like they're going to come back and probably do okay in my experience. And then on the right, um, you have a couple plants that are in that same mode. So you have a couple that are uh, on the bottom left and right that look like they're going to come probably come back. But again, when you look at the variability among populations, here's the population on the left that was sensitive to everything annihilated with 2,4-D at 1x and the population number seven on the right where 4x isn't quite um, getting the job done completely. So just to kind of finish up and remind you of a couple of things, you, you've heard us and you've heard us and also our county educators in pesticide recertification sessions talk about, you know, the seed production by water hemp and palmer amaranth and the need to stop seed and our no pig we left behind program and things like that. And I'm just going to remind you of a couple of things here. Um, they, these plants produce upwards of a million seeds per plant if they go season long. Shorter season plants come up late, don't provide, don't um produce quite as many, but you know, your decisions here, if you don't have water hemp or if you're just getting into water hemp, you can make some decisions that will make your future life easier or harder. And so you have control over some of these decisions. How aggressively are you gonna scout and prevent and making sure you're fully up to speed on, on what resistance you could possibly have and making sure you're getting help with the appropriate herbicide programs that they're complex enough, your residual stout enough, your rates of your residuals are high enough and things like that. And keeping in mind that, you know, the seed has a pretty short seed life, so you can wear out the seed bank. So if you get a field that has some issues to aggressive management, you can drive the population back down to near zero if you're just very aggressive about it. Um, you've all seen the slides before in terms of prevention. Another reason to use residual herbicides is they give you a first line of defense in that first part of the season. So if you're getting into an, a situation where water hemp seed has ended up in the field somehow, you have a line of defense with those residual herbicides to keep it out for a certain time. So even if your post-emergent herbicides miss it, your population's reduced. Um, we recommend, especially in soybeans, because you can see what's going on, um, you know, take some extra time, especially if you have water hemp in your area or you have started to have it in some fields and you think you might be spreading. It takes some extra time in late July into September, looking at your soybean fields, binoculars, whatever it takes to see if you've got some plants coming up. In some cases, it could be where wildlife's walking through or you have a flooded area or something like that. Um, you know, and, and look for mature seed. Usually, you know, you have a window in there where plants get some size and you can see them before they have mature seed and get them out of there before they produce seed. Um, one of the ways that I look at this is we tend to be on a roller coaster, I think, uh, with um, uh, water hemp populations where you uh, pick something and you get good control and then it develops resistance to that and you kind of let it go um, and you start to have higher populations and, and it doesn't take very long because it produces so much seed where you go from you know having a few plants to having a mess and not really realizing why it happened um, and then we start on next the next technology or site of action and we have the potential to do the same thing so it can be kind of a roller coaster and you're trying to shut down seed production to get in the middle of that um, I don't know if you can see on the right, but that's a photo we took during our water hemp seed collection in late September, I think. And there's water hemp plants in there along the road. And one of the things we have seen is combines are a really good way to spread water hemp. Once you get it in one field um, or a few fields, you know, you pull into the next field, start it up, the fans blow it out. Um, and then it tends to be a strip in there 
um, and then it starts to get spread by you know tillage or kind of whatever you're doing in there. And you know, so by the time we get there, in in this case, you know, the one on the left is is mid season, but that guy saw that field all year, and he did spray something post to take it out, and still had those plants left. Um, and then the field on the right, I don't know how many times the growers or somebody drove by that field and saw those plants there. And it would have taken probably half an hour to go through or chop them all down at some point. So, I mean, this is a type of preventative thing to think about that can really save you a lot of headaches in the end. Um, if you need any bumper stickers, magnets, we do have some of these. This is the whole basis for this campaign where we're really trying to be aggressively stop pigweed seed. Um, the weed control guide is available. We've kind of de-emphasized uh, selling it at county offices. Now you can go to the OS2 extension e-store and order it. So you can buy a PDF alone, which is cheaper than the hard copy. But if you buy the hard copy and get it shipped to you, you get the PDF also at no extra cost. So not a bad deal. And that is our information. I'm going to stop there and see if there's questions or comments. I think I have a couple minutes. Thanks, Mark. There are some questions for you in the Q&A, and if anybody has more questions, please go ahead and type those in. Um, first question, what levels of weed suppression have you seen using cover crops like cereal rye or other species of cover crops? Yeah, cereal rye is sort of your gold standard there. Um, I mean, it's the one that provides the most suppression. We've had, you know, I, I think it works best for mare's tail. One of the things about mare's tail is anything that gives you really strong cover ground cover into late fall. Oats can do it even though they winter kill, um, can give you really nice suppression of mare's tail. The work that we did, and I, and I have shown it a few times and I can certainly provide slides and in a, in a, the article if you wanna see it, um, on water, hemp and palmer, which was a regional study. Rye, at that point, you really need something that, that lasts as long as you can into the spring. And I think um, we found with rye, the later you kill it, the more suppression you get later end of the season, once you start talking about summer annuals, like, you know, summer germinating mare's tail or water hemp or palmer, we found the rye could give us up to 50% suppression of water hemp uh, three weeks after planting, after soybean planting. And so you're definitely getting some help. Once you get to the other ones, if especially for water hemp, something like water hemp, once you get to the, a lot of the other covers, you're not going to get as much help because you don't have the chemicals being secreted into the soil. So we give the most credit probably to rye and wheat and then starts to taper off. Having said that, um, you can uh, have an argument about why you would put something else in a mix with rye or wheat because you have, there's various reasons to plant cover crops. And so you may have another reason why you want to use another species, but kind of keep in mind that rye is uh, at the top in terms of its wheat suppression potential. Um, we have four videos on our YouTube site that cover various aspects of rye and show you some of that data of cover crops. And we're in the process of developing a fact sheet series. But if you go to YouTube, Ohio State University Weed Science, Alyssa Esman, who works with me, has done four different uh, cover crop videos that are good, and one of them covers the potential for suppression. Thank you. I'll put the link to those videos in the chat um, during our next presentation, so you all have those. Um, next question. With water hemp gaining resistance to several corn herbicides, does a one-pass program in corn still have a fit? Uh, a one pass program, I think, is, is going to be tough. You, if you have a low population and you still have populations that mostly respond and you're mixing, you're mixing multiple herbicides together and can, act, can get activity still out of all of them, I suppose it, it's possible. You're, you're really going to have to get in the habit of scouting your corn and then coming back post emergence if you need to. Um, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, we, we're starting to see that variability. Um, so it, it reminds me of giant ragweed to some extent, where my comment over the years has been. You know, you can start to put as many herbicides together in your pre-emergence in corn and bump rates and things like that, but it's a lot easier just to decide, okay, I'm going to budget for a post-emergence application to take out those that come through and I'll be happier with the control in the end. So if you're not going to do that approach to begin with, you certainly need to scout um, and start looking for escapes. I'll just leave it there. Okay, thanks. Um, how important is a three or four species crop rotation to wearing out the water hemp seed? Um, I'm not sure it's a species thing as much as it is um, getting control and keeping them from going to seed. So you, whatever makes that easiest. I mean, if you compare, for example, corn and soybeans, um, 
I think given our new platforms and soybean, you can get good control on both of those. The problem with corn is it hides the late ones, so you don't necessarily see them. Wheat is kind of a plus and a minus because wheat is a good, if your wheat stands good, um, you know, it'll take care of the water hemp and then you're just going to come back after wheat harvest and, and kind of look for some that might be, might be coming up late. If you get holes in your wheat stand and things like that, you can have some water hemp coming through. I, I mean, if you're going to go to uh, a forage, you're, you're basically got a four year, I mean, you're, you're down to about 0.3% of your seed viable after four straight years if you stop it from going to seed. So, I mean, if you go to a forage and you're in there for three or four years and you can accomplish that, you know, that's going to, that's going to be even better. Um, you know, going to a forage um, also, I think, um, if you're willing to do that, or even wheat and the wheat fallow to some extent, lets you use some other herbicides possibly that you're not using in corn and beans, uh, but maybe not with our new platforms. I would have said we didn't use them in 2,4-D or dicamba and beans, but now we can use them wheat stubble beans everywhere you want to use them, I guess, so, right? So follow-up in the water hemp screening, what efficacy level do glufosinate and dicamba provide, each provide in population number seven? And this is another question within it. Also, does 2,4-D choline provide improved efficacy over 2,4-D amine to this population of water hemp? Answer to question two is no. Um, 2,4-D is 2,4-D with regard to control. And then the, we did not test for glufosinate and dicamba, and that's because we're part of a regional project where we're submitting populations that are being screened, in this case by Missouri, and we screened uh, 10 or 15 water hemp populations to them. And, and we didn't, I don't know that that population got sent to them, but they are not finding anything in our Ohio populations yet with regard to loss of activity to glufosinate and dicamba. But uh, we did collect seed from survivors for that population seven, and that would be sort of our next step possibly to do that. So I, I guess the answer is I'm not, um, we don't have an efficacy level, but in general, that regional project is not finding a loss of efficacy in the populations that we've submitted. Um, what, with all the ALS resistance, why are the chemical companies mixing all the ALS chemistry with what we are really after? Um, you, you still gain um, when you put imazepurine, in, which is pursued or plimuron or first rate, they are just generally good across a range of weeds still that are going to help your other herbicides. They're um, the only they're the only herbicides that have any activity on giant ragweed. Now you may have ALS resistant giant and common ragweed, in which case they're not going to give you anything and there probably wouldn't be any point. It depends what else is in the mix. So if you're using like a Valor XLT, which is what Clemuron plus plus Valor. You know, Valor could use a little bit of help on a few weed species. It, it rounds it out. Um, you, you still have activity on those. It makes it, I think, a little bit more bulletproof is the way to say that. Having said that, there are a number of new premix products that have metribuzin and Valor or metribuzin and sulfentrazone or things like that. I, I get a little bit leery about, from a broadly standpoint, something relies just on metribuzin or just on primarily the Valor component, the fumioxids that are in the sulfentrazone. I'd rather see one of the ALS in there to kind of uh, give you a little bit better overall control. But I mean, it, once you're heavy on ALS resistant wheat species, especially your key ones, you could look at that and say, no, I'm better off investing my money uh, in a product that gives me full rates of either Valor or Sulfentrazone with Metribuzin, right? Or Pyroxysulfone. You could certainly make, make that argument, uh, especially because we have uh, better post options than we did five years ago or 10 years ago, right? So, yeah. Okay. Um, how long until G227 is available in all counties? I don't know. And I have a call into ODA for, it reminds me I need to get back with them. I don't even know why, why it happened that way, but we're not the only state that has it that way. So I, I don't know. I, I don't. I, you feel free to call ODA if you get an answer. You can tell. Let me know. And thanks for the reminder. I need to follow up. I don't know what's going on there. Okay, good question. Um, what is the preferred rate for linuron, and what are the preferred tank mix partners in regards mainly to water hemp? Oh, you know, I linuron it takes me back to graduate student days. I haven't really used it much since then. I would have to look at the rate. You, you can treat it like metribuzin in terms of what to put with it. Let's just say that um, the rate, I think we have it in the weed control guide and 
one of the problems with it is, as I, if I recall correctly, it's still kind of an expensive product, probably more expensive than Metribuzin, but there are some generics of it. So I'm fudging a little bit on the answer there. I would have to look at the rate structure and I would say, weed scientists have ignored linuron. We, we, I was in a meeting in September where we sat around and said, does anybody know anything about linuron? And I was the oldest guy in the meeting, like, and I didn't remember what I, what I knew about it. So um, we need to come back on that. It is a light soil herbicide. It doesn't do well in like more than 3% organic matter. Um, so it's, it's always been a herbicide that's more suited towards lighter, lower organic matter soils. Uh, it's not a really good answer. I can follow up and try to give you a little better answer. If you email me, I can try to give you a better answer. So we have Mark's contact information um, from that last slide. I can drop his email in the chat also if you wanted to follow up about that. Um, impact and treatment of purple dead metal. You know, it's a, it's a weed that's easily controlled in the fall. Um, I, it's in that category of weeds that just kind of keep the soil from drying out and warming up in the spring. It's a, it's a um, host for soybean cyst nematode. So if you leave it in there in the fall, whole soybean cyst nematode can possibly get an extra generation in. Um, one of the things about dead nettle in the fall is in the spring is you can kill it, but um, if you go back far enough, one of the reasons we started going to fall applications was these, these dense mats of winter annuals and some cold weather in the spring, the glyphosate 2,4-D was just slow. It, it is just slow. And so, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to reduce yield, but it, it's a, in some years, it can be just really difficult to control. And that, that's, that comes back to doing a fall application to try to keep it from getting um, to those levels. So I, you know, all those weeds, do they, do they reduce yield? I think they make your life kind of a pain in the neck in the spring is, is you know, that weed does, but it has some other negative components to it as well. I see Brian Mitchum's commenting, linear does not work well on organic matter above 2%. This does not provide much availability, light soils that can bring value. Yeah, worked for DuPont when Laux was a young man. <laughs> you work okay. Good. Thanks for the information. I was thinking 3%, but okay. And then uh, I can see the question, the scepter question. I mean, how effective is scepter as a pre since it's except, yeah, it's all ALS. So um, you're it once, I mean, it's broad spectrum. Um, it always has been, um, I'm trying to think of weaknesses. Uh, it, I mean, once you have ALS resistance, it's not going to control that. It was selling for at one time, I think like $6. So some people were taking scepter and creating, putting Metribuzin or something with it, creating their own sort of equivalent to like a canopy, but it's, you know, once you have ALS resistance, it's going to sit in that same category as classic or our first rate, I, I, we put it roughly on the same, and we have ratings for it still uh, in the weed control guide by with and without ALS resistance. So, so I mean, you can see the effect in this there. It, it no, they just weren't selling enough of it, but it dropped off. Um, and then I think Am, Amvac picked it up. I forget who picked it up. So I'm not sure, you know, what it's being sold for, or what the availability is, but it's roughly the it's roughly that same type of spectrum that first rate and classic bring. Okay, so our last question in the chat is, what is cost and effectiveness of using steel tillage um, towards weeds? Um, it depends on the weed. I mean, if you're not doing tillage for any other reason, you know, and then you're just gonna incorporate tillage, no pun intended there, to, um, to control weeds, I think you have to ask ask why. Um, there's a philosophy, and it's true that you know if you just if you don't till and leave all the weed seed on the surface and have a very aggressive herbicide program, you wear out your weed seed bank faster than once you bury some because it survives longer when it's buried compared to being left on the surface. Having said that, um, mares tail and water hemp and palmer amaranth once you bury them deep at all they don't like to come up from that they like to come up from very close to the surface mare's tail within like a quarter inch of the surface water hemp and palmer so you can put them down there and then not till it back up and they will you know eventually degrade degrade down there if you till it back up you sort of churn it and you kind of bring some back up to the surface the next year um giant ragweed and the big seeded weeds giant ragweed common ragweed cockleburr 
Um, you're going to reduce populations faster in a no-till situation than you will tilling. Giant ragweed is actually best adapted to tillage every other year. That's what it really likes for whatever reason. So it kind of it kind of depends. Uh, um, I, and now if you're looking at after interrow cultivation after the crops emerge, that's a great way to reduce some of your dependency on herbicides. We've done it. I think a lot of people have done it in the past. Your big issue is what do I do with a herbicide with the plants that are right in the row with the crop? So you can ban spray or something like that, but you can do that. We typically found that we got 60 to 70 percent can weed control when we did it in combination with rotary host because because of those weeds in the in the row within the row uh, in that situation. So I I don't know if that answers all your questions. I it's you know it's hard to recommend tillage. You can take care of certain weeds and help you out from year to year. Certainly with mare's tail, does reduce populations of water hemp into the next year. Um, as a long-term strategy, you can make an argument for leaving all the seed on the surface and rotating your herbicides and making sure nothing goes to seed by walking fields end of the year. So that's a really long-winded answer. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head of the cost for tillage. We have those in our worksheets, right, somewhere, but I don't know the, I don't know all of them off the top of my head. They, they a, a cult of a tillage between crops, is it gonna replace your herbicides? I think that's the issue. It will for Mary's tail, but it's not going to replace the rest of them. So, well, I think we got all the questions for now. So, thank you so much, Mark, for sharing your knowledge with everybody. Here.